accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints, just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're continuing our run through of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right now we're up to the fifth episode of the fourth season. It's called Indiscretion. It first aired on the 20, uh, 23rd of October 1995. Teleplay goes to Nicholas Correa and story goes to Tony Marbury and Jack Trevino, directed by old friend LeVar Burton, who played Jordi LaForge on TNG. In this episode, Kira and Ducat search for the six-year-old crash site of a Cardassian freighter that was carrying Bajoran prisoners. Also, Cisco deals with Cassidy moving on to the station, a new development in their relationship. We're joined by Clay. Clay, how are you? I'm good. Uh, having another person on this podcast is a uh, very big step. <laughs> Would you say <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say it's a big step. It's a very big step. And we are joined very by big step. we're joined by Andrew, patron Andrew, who is a captain level supporter of the show, which is much appreciated. And as always, captain level patrons have a chance to come on the show and share their thoughts about an episode. Andrew, you chose indiscretion or I limited you to indiscretion. I can't remember, but how, how are you? <laughs> well, no, I'm doing very well, Wes. Thank you. Uh, it's good to meet you, Clay. And uh, you too. Uh, no, I, I think I listed a couple of them, but they both had things to do with like families family structures and things and this was the this is the one that kind of won out so I'm, I'm happy to be here for indiscretion sure well thank you for coming on we're going to um we'll take a break then we'll come back we'll play an audio clip we're going to come back and between gonna... this one and visitor this show isn't going to just turn into like a group therapy session is it <laughs> well that's what this <laughs> kind of seems that way doesn't it <laughs> that's what this podcast is going to be about uh, we're going to take... the head writer on this show around this time just like lose custody of a kid or something <laughs> that, so he's having a lot of like paternal issues that he's working out we're going to take a break, play an audio clip. Me, Andrew, and Clay are going to come back and break down indiscretion. Hope you don't take this the wrong way, Major, but I've always admired you. You are the embodiment of the new Bajor. A Bajoran born out of the ashes of the occupation. A Bajoran tempered with Cardassian steel. Oh, Captain Sisko's right. You are in love with the sound of your own voice. I know you find this hard to accept, but... I believe that in some ways the occupation actually helped Bejor. Which part? The massacres or the strip mining? I have no desire to debate the merits of the occupation with you. I'm even willing to admit that perhaps we were a little harsh in our methods. But the fact is, the Bajoran people are stronger now than they have been in centuries. All right, everybody. So, indiscretion. Uh, the group therapy session is in full swing, <clears throat> and uh, we're dealing with family again. We're dealing with the Cisco's. We're dealing with Kira. We're dealing with the Ducat. And this is a uh, this is an episode that could have gone in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm just trying to think about how to sort of crack into it. I, the, to me, the episode is really defined by its ending, but I don't want to get there yet. Uh, it's a showcase for Ducat, and what's kind of funny about the episode is that it leads you off thinking that's going to be a Kira episode when Kira really doesn't have much to do besides be the Deep Space Nine character who's with Ducat as the episode happens. Mm -hmm. um, Clay, what would you think about indiscretion in general? Um, I liked it. Uh, I thought... There were uh, certain elements of it that kind of were very abruptly cut off. Um, like the uh, so, first question is the the ship that they're looking for has that come up before? No. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't sure, uh, but knowing that, I can say what I was what I was thinking, which is I thought the cold open to this was terrible. Because uh, it's about 30 seconds long, and they're talking about shit that you have no idea what's going on. Yeah, she's talking uh, to the Total Recall doctor in Bajoran yeah. Makeup. Yeah, and they talk about this ship, and they do the big, like, you know, music swell. And I was watching it going like, I, is this something that they talked about before? Because they're giving you the, the cue as though you're supposed to care about what this is, but it's just a word. Oh, see, I, and, it, uh, it I, clearly next... seems it, it clearly seems like it's one of those things that the way that opens, like they would have mentioned three or four episodes back, you were supposed yeah. to remember, but now it just, it doesn't hit like that. Right. And not to mention they give Worf that little cameo, his one line of the episode. Uh, well, the the thing about it, see, I, I read it differently, I guess. They, they lay on the drama in a way that is 
to help you understand it's supposed to be important, but you don't know about it. You know, it, it has that like I music. I understand swell. that, but I really don't like when people do that. Sure, that's I, fine. I, because they do the same thing. You know, the next scene coming after the credits is they continue to talk about it without really explaining what it is, and I feel that's like a. I I I don't like that as a device to generate like mystery, because uh, it's artificial. Yeah, just talking about something, a word that people don't recognize, but talking about it abstractly and not defining it doesn't make me want to know what it is. It just makes me annoyed. Yeah. But see, I, in some way, I, I appreciated that, though, because it wasn't like we just had the exposition fairy show up. True. Um, yeah. You know, so it was like they were talking about it like clearly this is something that particularly her and Odo have talked about many, many times before. And so now they're picking up a conversation like there's nothing major to it. Um but it, the, the part that got me was the fact of, once again, we're bringing up somebody out of nowhere who, if they're this important, shouldn't we have heard about them before? Mm-hmm. Um, right. You know, they, they played the same card with Lee Nollis, with Burial, with Shakar, and now, and now they're bringing it up again with the Ravenock. Like, how have we not heard about this yet? Well, the, the thing about the Ravenock is that I'll, I'll split the difference between the criticisms like the way that they introduce it is funny because it implies this sort of you should know about it aspect however what the ship was actually doing is not memorable enough where people should remember it outside of kira you know what i mean like odo shouldn't have it because the ship wasn't carrying like a super weapon or anything it seems like it was a pretty run-of-the-mill freighter transport vessel that uh, everyone mm-hmm. just seems to remember. So you're stuck in this spot where Kira would know it because she had that friend who was on it who uh, just dies because there's no reason for Kira to be in the episode except for her to escort uh, Dukat. So they just kill her friend off and no one cares. Um, mm-hmm. But y- y- you know what I mean? Like the, I don't want to get hung up on it. It's it, it's yeah, really yeah. just to get the ship and a reason for Kira to go into it. But it is kind of inconsistent in how it's portrayed about what you because my takeaway from the very early start is, oh, there must have been a super secret on that ship. There must have been something really like important that these people are hunting after. And you get that impression from the Cardassians caring about the ship, but they only care about it because they need Dukat to get involved in the plot line. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it, it, it's you know, it doesn't ruin the episode for me, but it's just I just that sort of that style of storytelling I think is a little bit is cheating a little bit. Um, and uh, the other thing that the bookend to my abruptness comment is um, at the end when uh, uh, he reconciles with his daughter, that happens very quickly. And mm-hmm. it's just kind of she has this uh, impassioned speech and he just kind of goes, all right, let's go. And then they just kind of leave. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was a little bit abrupt, but everything else I thought was really good. I liked it a lot. I'm going to let's I, I want to avoid talking about the ending because I think that the yep. episode actually hinges on the ending, like the last couple scenes. And I'll, I'll throw it to you, Andrew. Um, what's your like? It's a Ducat episode. And did you notice anything different about Ducat or any, what do you think of the episode in terms of what it brings to Ducat for this one? Well, for most of his early run, uh, Ducat has just been a villain, just flat out. He's a bad guy. You know, he's going to cause trouble. You know, he had the situation. He tried to set up the politician from Cardassia. He was the overseer of the occupation, all these different things. And now in season four, from Way of the Warrior to now, he's sl- he, they're humanizing him a little bit. They're making him... The Maquis is the start of that, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. The two-part of Maquis is where they kind of stopped just him being the generic villain and they started to add a little bit of nuance to him. Yeah, and, and we get to the point now where it is clearly... There's clearly emotion that is raw for him when they get to the Ravenock, um, and it's real, and it... He's clearly already... Um, debating with himself what he's going to do um, and how he's going to resolve this situation. So for Dukat, this is that continued human, uh, humanization and it, in many respects, it's like a face turn. Um, you know, in this episode, you know, he's been this big heel and now he's going to, you, you think for a little bit that maybe he is going to be a redeemable character um, and not just be that bad guy. Yeah. I would, you know, I'll throw it to you then, Clay. I would describe the the thing about... I think this is a really fantastic Ducat episode just mm. because his he has a little arc 
throughout the entire thing, and I find it really satisfying, where they open with him on the station, and then the shuttlecraft thing, where he's being incredibly overbearing and condescending, and he actually gives a... I saw this argument on Twitter. I guess some alt-right account was making the Cardassians did the Bajorans a favor argument that got retweeted into me. So, <laughs> oh, it's, it's yes, yeah, it sounds so much like a white supremacist line. It is. Oh yeah, it, yeah. So <laughs> they, they set him up with that sort of horrible like, or the Nazis did the Jews a favor type of logic from Dukats, and you're like, oh Jesus, like, and you're getting a weird, creepy sexual predator vibe from him when he's talking to Kira, and then it humanizes him. You learn about this mistress thing. He finds his daughter. Alemo's reaction when he finds his daughter is clearly of a man who is hoping that he would find her dead so that he didn't have to kill her himself. Mm -hmm. He's depressed that he found her alive. And then it gets into the ending. So the the thing that's nice to me about this episode, and Clay, you can comment on it, is Ducat's... They're setting up Ducat as it fits your definition of him where he is a position, rank-driven person who's only out for himself. Yet it Mm -hmm. adds a little bit of conflict to him where... He will still always be a, the horrible person that the Cardassian general and leader of the occupation can be, but he has these gnawing doubts within him about everything that he's doing. He he does have a he does have like a soul or a conscious, but he's very easily able to stomp on it if he needs to. Yeah, I ex- the thing that I really liked about it is that they actually threw everything that he he goes through in this episode. the The writing for him is extremely consistent. It's uh, his characterization is very consistent, even up until the point really where he meets his daughter face to face. Um, the erring on the side of politics thing is is still his main drive. Yeah, like th- that scene on uh, uh, when he's talking to Kira on the ship, giving the white supremacist argument. He's probably being a dick to her, but he is also, you know. He he's trying to connect with her in a really kind of messed up way where it's like, well, hey, I mean, you know, there's no reason you need to hate me completely because, I mean, we kind of did you guys a favor. Yeah. Like he's 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 definitely he's definitely playing playing the uh, the game for himself still. And he, I mean, that continues through his uh, plan to kill this girl just to make sure sh- because he yeah, he could bring her back to, to Cardassia, but that would be, you know, ruinous for him. Uh, politically and personally, so he's not going to do that. But the great thing about the episode is they put him in a situation that forces him, those two sides of him, to, to conflict. Yes. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really great. I think uh, it, they do a, a great job of uh, of really amplifying those little bits of humanity that they've dropped in along the way up to this point. Um and yeah, I, and I think it has to be Kira doing it too. I mean, I don't think anybody else could have gone with him and and made this story make sense. Or, Cisco as a know, parent, work as well. I think Cisco as a parent being there would would have worked in a yeah, different way. It would yeah, it would have worked in a, on a, on a different way. But I think the fact that that specifically his daughter is specifically half Bajoran, I yes. think it it has to be Kira. Yeah, Andrew, anything you want to add to that? Well, it it's, it's very, you know, the whole B story then with this question of what it worked with Cisco goes into this dichotomy between the two of them where Cisco always defaults to family. You know, he almost walked away from Starfleet. He almost turned down the assignment. He's almost done all these things to help his family. Mm -hmm. And Ducat has thrown his family seemingly under the bus every time he can to get the next step up, to get the next ability, to get the next responsibility. And so there's this dichotomy that is even just in this episode about who Ducat has been and now who we think or hope he will be. Yeah, they're a they're a yin and a yang to each other. And they, they are good foils against each other because they're not so blatantly opposites in a way that bad writing can be, but they do sort of complementary, complete a whole person between Ducat and Cisco. The, uh, yeah. the B-plot, we can just bring that in now. The B-plot here is funny to me because it's... It's like a generic human concept idea thrown into a Star Trek episode. And I don't even think it's bad. It's more just like it's more the conflict is so small and they don't really flesh it out or bring any kind of attention to it. Like you end up with Cisco ends up at the line saying, like, I just don't want you here because Jennifer died doing Starfleet stuff. And I don't want you to do that. And you're like, I I guess that makes sense. I don't really buy that for the reason he's doing this. It feels more to me like a, a small slice of life scene where... 
I relate to it on a personal level. Like when someone tells me something, I never seem to get excited enough for them. You know, like, <laughs> like yeah. whenever my wife tells me some new thing and I don't respond the right way, we have this kind of an argument where it's like, and I have the very Larry David thing of like, I never get excited about anything. Like I can be looking forward to it, but I never get like emotionally excited that something is actually going to happen. And it was, it's I'm just really small... looking forward to your son's first birthday or second birthday. <laughs> yeah. or, or old he is. <laughs> He's, um, you, you know what I mean? Like the, the small slice of lifiness, I, I liked it, but it's a very, maybe you need it if you're tying into the Decotton Cure stuff. But what would you think, Clay, of the, uh, the, the, the B story here of Cisco moving in with uh, his girlfriend or his girlfriend moving in with him? You know, I'm usually the one who's extremely critical of, of plots that just don't have any stakes attached to them. But I actually liked this B plot. It, it was, um, it feels natural. Yeah, I was I was thinking about it as I was watching it and and the thing that I kept coming back to is like this kind of is a fairly sizable or or I should say cements the idea that they've taken a step forward in the way that they handle this show and and the characters and the plots because this plot is entirely character based and it's entirely hinges on uh, it's not just a you know romantic tiff. It's a romantic tiff where you, the viewer, know the backstory of Cisco and know about his wife and know that this is you know his first relationship since that, and it feels really honest and it feels believable. And even though the stakes are extremely low, I think the people in it are good enough and it's fun enough that. It kind of, you know, it held my attention and I wasn't kind of just, you know, like brushing it off because it just it felt like, you know, we've talked about this before. We're kind of in that space where uh, the characters have become well-rounded enough that just kind of watching them do stuff for the most part is at least, you know, baseline enjoyable. Yeah, the writers have a handle on them well enough where they can make boring scenes enjoyable enough to watch. Um, Yeah, and I and I would. I find something like this more interesting at this point than if they had uh, tried to work in some hand-fisted yeah. Yeah, sci-fi thing about, like, well, the real reason she can't stay on the thing is because the the oscillator's broken. Right. Okay. Well, I yeah. mean, so, you know, what, I'll just throw it to you, Andrew. I'll just, I'll just say that the, um, the, the way I would define the writing as the writing has improved is, you know, remember the scene where Dax Bashir... Quark and Cisco are in Quark's bar talking about Cassidy moving in. I I really like that scene. It's, I it's a that scene beautiful, was great. beautiful scene that is written with maybe some of the best Trek humor that's ever happened. Where he leaves and Dax says, "I think it's a big deal," and Bashir says, "I think it's a very big deal." It's like it's a mm-hmm. good subtle joke that they stuck in there, and it works in a way that the Ferengi centric humor just is awful and sucks. But that's like good Star Trek comedy writing right there. And Andrew, I, I honestly, I really liked. Quark's advice. Yes, I, I did that, too. that scene was great. <laughs> I mean, that, that took me back to every girl I ever asked out in high school who said no to me, but then went with some horrible guy for yeah. the next six months. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, wait a second, th- there's no logic here. Um, yeah, Quark's, it, the, uh, Quark's in- internally consistent. We'll give him that. And I uh, like yeah. the w- what's his final line to them? Like you, when when she leaves you, what does he say? When she leaves you, I think he says that's what the hollow suites are for. That's what yes. they're right. That's a perfect quark line. Yeah, yeah. and that, then oh. Bashir retorts with the "It's amazing the uh, they reproduce. The, they reproduce I, at all." Not to yeah. go on a complete tangent here, but I I forgot to mention this during uh, of all episodes, the visitor. Um, is there another Star Trek show that references the holodeck but never shows it? Uh, they've because shown this it. show they reference it all the time, but they never show it. Well, they showed it in uh, Way of the Warrior. You saw the uh, Kira and Dax having their massages. True. Yeah, I shouldn't say never, but it's like it comes oh, up I all see. the time. But it's it, whereas on TNG, it's like every time they talk about it, they're in it or have just come out of it. Well, they've ne- they've never had an episode that deals with it. They reference it, but they never are in it for the entire episode, like a TNG episode. Does. Well, they also it, it's also different in the fact of it's a station, and there's likely far more other things to do as well. Yes, versus that's true. You know, Voyager or, D, or Next Gen when you're out light years away and that's it. So, um, uh, well, who's I'll, in charge of cleanup of that thing? <laughs> I don't know. That's, man, that'd be a awful job. Why, why do you think Nog wants to join Starfleet so badly? Yeah. For? <laughs> <laughs> He's always carrying that bucket. Odo's bucket is a multi use bucket. Um, I'll say that the, you know, 
uh, maybe a little personal story here. Maybe it's not connected, but maybe you guys can draw something out of it. When I was uh, when I was dating my now wife, and we decided to move in together, we I'd never lived with just one person or uh, one relationship before. She's my first one to live with, and the um, we were we had booked a place in Brookline, uh, not cheap, not affordable. Um, by myself, we needed each other to do it. And the night before we were supposed to move in, we were spending the night at her apartment. And she just started bawling and crying, saying that uh, she wasn't sure this was the right thing to do. We're married now, so it obviously all worked out. And this is not the saddest story that could have happened to me. But I can I can share Cisco's um, hesitation here. Do, do you actually believe that the reason he doesn't want to do it is because of the Starfleet thing? Or do you think something else is going on there? I I don't know if it's explicit. I mean, the Starfleet thing probably has something to do with it, but it. I think the Starfleet excuse is a better excuse than if he was like, I don't know. It's kind of quick, right? But isn't that doesn't that that would be that would tie into my story? Like that feels like the realistic argument. Do you think that that's a bad way to go in a Star Trek episode, or just a bad way to go in the TV show in general? Um, no. I, you know, I, 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 I should say. I don't think it's a bad way to go. I think I understand the why they went the way they did, but I would have found it just as acceptable if he was like, "Listen, I this is my first relationship since my wife died." Yep. Uh, this might be moving a little bit fast. Um, <laughs> I, like I I would be fine with that, but I can I can understand why the captain of of your uh, your Star Trek show needs to be a little bit more. Um, uh, hesitant yeah reticent yes, to do yeah. this stuff i mean i feel everyone else is pushing cisco in a way that he doesn't want to go like dax is trying to get it to happen everyone's trying to get get it to happen cassidy yates is really pushing it and it's it's surprising to me just the re- the reveal that it's because he has these feelings of he wants to protect her and not have harm come to her i don't buy i feel it's more the way the episode is going it's more he's being pushed quickly in a way that he doesn't want to go so that would be i'm agreeing with you clay i guess but andrew what do you think well he also the nature of this too is he also has a kid. Um, yep, right. And, Who gives you know, terrible so, advice in this episode? But go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's a hilarious scene, but it, it you know it gives terrible advice. But it, he has a son, so there there's a whole another dynamic at play of him getting into this relationship. There's him dealing with his status as a widower and what is it going to be like being in a relationship for the first time. What is his son going to think? Um, how does I mean? Because unlike a starship, um, you know the the station there there's different layers of hustle and bustle and what that looks like so i i think it's just he's it's quick for him and he hasn't thought it all out i think he was just having fun and now she's ready to take the next step and he's that that's a little too big of a step for him at the moment does it surprise you that it's not the other way around because she she seems more like the kind of character who would be like, uh, hey, I got shit to do, man. I can't right. just be living with you. I'm a freewheeling freighter captain who makes my own yeah. schedule, yeah. She she seems very, you know, uh independent and capable, whereas I could I could I could feasibly see it being reversed where Cisco was like, uh, I'm thinking about asking her if she wants to stay on the station and then he does and she's like, uh right. you know, and then he kinda reacts negatively. I th- I think that's I think that's more in character with both of them. Actually, I think that Cisco wanting to move on and, you know, we've we've had the thing with uh, the visitor and Jake and maybe Cisco's at a place now where he realizes that he needs to seize the moment, you know, as an outcome of the visitor storyline. Um, mm-hmm. He doesn't want to let life pass him by. And maybe he would be like, oh, yeah. I really like this girl. Maybe I should bring her into my world and her being very off put by that. And just, you know, it, it it's weird to see Cisco, the, the captain of the station, be so put upon by the other characters i think is kind of like he, he he obviously is capable of being in that leadership role so it, the, his response to these things feels a little bit weird to me um well he's a, he's also the only one of the captains who would go to his officers as a friend like that to ask advice that's true yeah that's true yeah and he also went to bashir who maybe would give the worst advice possible <laughs> yeah. of what we've seen so captain what you want to do is you want to <laughs> not call her for two weeks <laughs> And then when she says, says, where have you been? You say, I've just been busy. Choke her a little bit. Only if she's into it. But uh, so, so, uh, Jake's advice, which I thought was terrible, but the episode treats as good as if things don't work out, they don't work out, which out of the mouth of a 16-year-old, I think makes total sense. But as a 
as a 35 year old man at this point, that is some of the worst advice I've ever heard yeah. in my life. <laughs> um, a- just do things because if it doesn't work out, what's the big deal about the downside? There's a lot of downside here, Jake Cisco. Uh, ben Cisco should have paid more attention to you. You guys have any I other mean, thoughts about this one? He might just have a more optimistic view of relationships being a 16 year old who yes, was apparently I mean. dating a. No, I mean a 16 year old who was dating a Dabo girl. Oh, <laughs> inexplicably <laughs> well the other the other side can be also you know in your own relationship sometimes when people are start seeing each other or they don't want to quite start seeing each other but everybody around them knows mm. that there's an amazing relationship just waiting but it just if nobody's willing to take that first step mm-hmm. it almost seems like everybody around cisco is going this is perfect for you why are you being hesitant yeah do you think right. the episode backs that up though or does it come across as the characters just kind of... To me, it comes across as the characters being annoying towards him and not in a way that I find helpful to, or lo- that they're looking out for his best interest. It's more like they're trying to, like, embarrass... Like, Dax feels like she's trying to embarrass him on some level, or maybe not embarrass, but just be that really annoying friend who will say that thing yeah. that pushes you in a way that you don't want to go in front of other people. That's what I get from her. Yeah, that, no, that, uh, that's fair. Yeah, that, that scene with, with Dax and Bashir it does kind of... It feels less like they are have his best interests at heart and more just like, well, we need something to gossip about, so you should do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any thoughts about this B plot? I, I want to return to the A plot because it's the meat of the episode. It's the important thing. But if you guys have something we've, else. I think we've talked about the B plot longer than it is actually on screen. <laughs> So well, I mean, well, Andrew, would you? Sorry, guys. My fault. Would you, <laughs> no, would you agree with Clay's point about what do you think is unique about the B stories in the show at this point? Because I think that this B story is they, consistent with what the B stories do now in the show. With with the rare exception from from here on out, I mean they're they're pretty much all character based. Um, I mean they they have shifted away from the crappy we have to figure out something sci fi to do into these characters have real lives and we're going to explore them. Um, whether that's uh, Cisco here with the. Uh, with Cassidy Yates or with that's later with uh, uh, Kira and relationships with Pete, you know, it, it, these things develop and it's, it flows much more naturally in these B plots now than it did in the last couple of seasons, especially. It feels when the people are hanging out, it feels like they actually hang out in this universe and it's not a stilted TNG. We're sitting at the same table and 10 forward kind of thing. Like it, the, yeah. the station feels very lived in at this point and that these people do have free time and they do hang out with each other in this way. Like Dax yeah. and Bashir would hang out with Cisco. Um, and I think it's a, it's a level of comfort. I think that early on in the series, when you're concerned about your show continuing and not sure what it has, you feel like you, those moments need to have something about them. Like they need to be action. There needs to be an action to the scene. And Mm -hmm. I think the show thought that too much and it tried too hard to bring those actiony sci-fi. There's a quantum singularity thing causing people to become invisible. Like you don't really need that. And I think DS nine does so much better when it stays away from that stuff and it sticks to, as you're saying, the character-based plots. That they I mean, do D- Deep Space Nine very much feels like the show that the characters really would get together and play poker with each other. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, yeah. Um, so I'm going to, we'll, we'll get back to the A plot here. The, my, I didn't really remember this episode. Um, and when it got to the ending, when Dukat meets Zayal, his daughter, and uh, he runs into her and he lowers his gun and they embrace, I, I said to myself, Oh, oh no, the episode shot itself in the foot. It was going really well, and it blew it at the ending. I can't believe it. And I was watching it, and I had the little Netflix timer in the bottom, and I'm like, they've only got 15 seconds to save the episode. Like, are they, they honestly <laughs> screwed it up. How are they going to do this? And the last 15 seconds, Ducat ends the episode with a single line that completely saves the ending, where he is not in a... He has not suddenly switched and become the good guy who's going to take his daughter home to Cardassia and bear the brunt of everything. He, his final line is, I'll let you know. He says it to Kira um, about the situation, about how the politics are going to handle him. My interpretation of the line is that Ducat is a little bit annoyed and he is going to hold Kira personally responsible if anything goes wrong for him. He knows that he he is still, he's not the loving father that the embrace has sort of paired, uh, shown us to be when he's embracing Zayal. It's more, 
he made the right thing, but he's very begrudging and he's willing to take this out on somebody who caused it. And that's being Kira. Uh, Clay, what'd you think? Yeah, I would agree with that too. I, uh, that last scene was, was really good. And the way that, uh, Kira plays it too, I thought was great. Cause she kind of has like, as he's walking away, <clears throat> she kind of has like a little smirk and then she kind of does a double take and realizes what he said yeah. and the way that he said it. And they kind of ended on her being like, Oh, that didn't, that actually wasn't that good. Um, but I, yeah, I think, I think they maintain, uh, Ducat's character even through this point, because I, what he does is not a straight like face turn. He's you, like the, the next episode he's in, you don't expect, based on his actions in this episode, for him to go out of his way to help anybody on Deep Space Nine or, you know, like, be buddy-buddy with anybody. He's still, there's still that gray area where it's like, yeah, he saved this girl, but not necessarily for the reasons that you think. And the way that he made that pointed mark at, at Kira, it's like, you could all, I, I almost took it as, like, he he was going to kill her, but he didn't as a favor to Kira. Yes. Or something like that. So as a like, way to impress it, her and their romantic relationship, maybe. You yeah. Can say <laughs> well, and there's, and there's, I mean, that, that whole scene with, with Zial and, and the decision not to do it, and then that last line, I'll let you know, sets up, I mean, in a, in a vacuum, it's like, ooh, that sounds ominous, but when you look at what happens just even 15 episodes later and how Ducat develops from here, I mean, he very much hinges on this whole father-daughter dynamic from here on out yeah does the daughter come back she does oh cool. i won't say any anything more about that but she no. does come back yeah. <laughs> um the well i, I mentioned does this she come back dating jake cisco <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can hope it, it it it's different just just wait you'll i don't know if you'll enjoy it or not but i'd uh, call that a big yes <laughs> she comes she comes back uh this season so there's not much longer to wait um and I, I this time this, she has a nose ring i say this because the memory alpha here says uh mark Lamo thought it was interesting to play the character throughout the series as if he had a re- hope for a relationship with kira in the fu- future excuse me and the producers agreed the final scene in the episode when he says i'll let you know is a nod towards his hope for a more intimate relationship with kira it's funny that's that is what you're saying clay i don't i didn't read it that way i never saw that i saw his final line as a very threatening line as opposed to a i'm doing this to impress oh. you yeah, no, I, I don't think he was, I, I don't mean that he was doing it to impress her. I think it, my my thought was like, he was, he says it that way because maybe he's rationalizing that the reason that he did this was, or maybe, maybe not, maybe it is part of the reason that he did this is because to somehow ship, I, I don't want to say like make up for the stuff that he did to the Cardia- to the uh, Bajorans, but like there's a certain basic source, part of his his decision was predicated on doing her a favor, kind of you know, like you know what I mean. It's it's not. I don't think he's doing it because he's got the hots for Kira. Is mm-hmm. that something that happens? But it, but even well, but even earlier in the episode, he alludes to the fact he wants to have a relationship yes. with her when they're in the runabout. Yeah, I mean, he makes a reference to. She says, "Oh, you and I will never be friends," and he just says, "Oh, we'll see." You know, it's the, he has yeah, this. Okay, weird... so yeah, it might it might be part of that, but I I never thought it was like a romantic thing. Is, right. it, is that I is think that, it's is that something from... that happens? Oh, no, but the, the like it, I'm responding to it off of this quote where Mark Lamo thought it would be interesting to play the character as if there was a chance for a relationship, and the like he he's approaching Ducat as if he thinks he can win over Kira, and. Mm-hmm. This thing is saying that his final line is a nod towards that, where he's saying uh, he's hoping for an intimate relationship with her. I find the line very threatening. I don't find that at all. I find it he is upset with the way that his career could potentially go because of this decision, and he's going to let yeah. her hear about it if anything bad happens to him. Yeah, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think they could be both the part of the same thing. You know, Because okay. I think... Uh, it, it, assuming that the relationship he wants with her is not a romantic one, if you think about it from Ducat's angle, winning over Kira would be a huge boost to anything that he has to do, On especially now that, you know, the... Because uh, that, that conversation they have on the runabout where he's kind of like, well, we kind of did you a favor, is sort of the kind of thing that... the Not, you know, not that I've ever had that kind of conversation with somebody, <laughs> but, like, if you... If, you've, if both sides of... If these two enemies are now at peace 
I can see that as being kind of a ra- rationalization of trying to like, you know, smooth things out and be like, well, you know, I mean, we, you did some bad stuff. I did some bad sure. stuff, but I mean, r- now we're even stronger than we were apart, you know? Cause so maybe this isn't all bad. And she, cause she is such a, she's got an inroad to the Starfleet and she's such a hardcore Bajoran, you know, free former freedom fighter and all that kind of stuff. If he can win her, then that Help, gives yeah. him an inroad with the Bajorans. And if, let's say, Cardassia decides to go rogue again, well, he's got, well, he's now has this piece. Well, I, I've got Kira Norris on my side, so we can, you know, that, that gives us a lot of latitude. It's, I think it's, I think it's all consistent with him that it's another political move that he's making, but the secondary subtext of it is he is dealing with these personal things that he's trying to not admit that's what he's doing. Yeah. Andrew, what would you think? Do you have anything you want to add to that? Or what's your personal uh, opinion about the ending there? Um, it, it's ominous, but I, I think it hits both the, you know, whatever I lose out of this, I'm going to get back and I'll show you. And, you know, uh, you know, someday you'll see I'm not, you know, someday you'll see me better than you see me now type type dynamic. He He wants her approval in some way, whether that's, uh, from a military perspective, from a personal perspective, from a romantic perspective, and he's going to try everything he can to get it, as twisted and perverse as it seems. Um, so that that last line, the the "I'll let you know," um, is both ominous from his professional standpoint and ominous, I think, for Kira that he's going to continue to push her and try to get that relationship with her. Ducat is interesting to me just because he is the. Uh, I know Trex Prestige says a video that's the the headline is kind of, you know, I say this with uh, no hostility. He has kind of a clickbaity title of um, is Dukat Star Trek's greatest villain. And Dukat to me is Dukat to me is fleshed out and fully realized, at least in these parts of the series, in a way that none of the other Star Trek villains really are. Like, there's mm. a... If, Dukat feels like he can actually exist in the universe and that he would have these conflicting ideas and conflicting outlooks and conflicting personality traits. And when he does bad things, he has a reason to do it. And when he does good things, you also believe that he has a reason to do it. He is not the sort of megalomaniac evil villain that star trek tends to like a lot of the time there's a nuance Mm -hmm. to him that i think is refreshing and it's it's helpful for the series and it's uh it's impressive that they've managed to write him and garrick um similarly but different yeah because they both have the same sort of like you know playing both sides thing but the way that Ducat does it is completely different from the way that Garrick does it. And that the what fact would you that say they is the difference to, between the two of them, how would you describe the difference between them? I think, you know, part of what you said is kind of sums it up is everything that Ducat does, you believe you believe him when he does it, whether that's a bad thing or a good thing. Do uh Garrick, you can't believe anything he says, good or bad. You know, there's right. there's always the underlying possibility that what he's telling you is bullshit whereas ducat is generally truthful and i i sometimes put garrick's personality onto ducat and i think i doubt ducat more than the show wants me to yeah um, sometimes where i think he's being deceitful when he's really not i think ducat actually wears his heart on his sleeve more than i give him credit for yeah well, he, it, i mean it, he's he's the the honest villain you know he's going to tell you what he's going to do and why he does it and he's going to justify it in his own twisted worldview right he doesn't he doesn't have to deceive you at least not in the same way because where when ducat tells you something he is being honest but you're you're left thinking well why did he just tell me that right N- not it, not well is what he told me true you're all you can always come away thinking that ducat's told me something true but why do, how does it benefit him for him to have told me that yeah that's interesting ducat you wonder about his motive and with garrick you wonder about the information itself yeah i guess is the difference between the two of them um because garrick's motivation and feels a little bit more clear and clean cut to me um well that was good do we do we have anything else you guys want to bring up before we go to final thoughts yeah i do uh are sci-fi helmets the most useless piece of equipment <laughs> in all of fiction because it seems like they always look cool 
But then, like, you, like, n- hit somebody lightly with a stick, and they are out. Is there, like, explosive <laughs> darts or something inside of every sci-fi helmet that just renders them useless? Well, I mean, maybe I'll... I'll and and I'll that def- armor, right? You know, the ar- the <laughs> armor suit they're wearing? Armor, yeah. yeah. I'll defend it with a Star Trek geekery. It's like, well, you know, the Breen come from an ice world. Maybe he, he let the heat in a little bit too much when he jar- jostled their helmet slightly, and they got a little bit overwhelmed and uh, melted or something. But and that, that brings And that brings up another goofy point. So the whole point of Star Trek, they keep saying all over again that nobody's ever seen the Breen, right? Yeah. Haven't Kieran Dukat now seen a Breen? You would think so. Listen... <laughs> Listen, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but I feel like both of you need hard wedgies right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, well, we'll assume they found those Breen outfits in like a Breen locker room, and they didn't actually do anything <laughs> to take them from people. But yeah, those are the uh, the Breen, who look goofy as hell. Um, they look like they're TOS aliens that got stuck in the DS9 somehow. They look um, like Battlestar Galactica villains. Is what they that's look like. true. They do look like Cylons a little well, bit. Well, the, the the there was a goofy where it was on a Reddit somewhere. Somebody was saying that the uh, the helmet the Breen wear are just like the uh, the Princess Leia helmet in uh, yes. Return of the Jedi. I was thinking the same thing, only a giant <laughs> version of it. So um, the Breen aren't important clay, but they recur. Uh, uh, so that's about it. Um, they're these kind of characters. Um, so how? Here's my, my final question. How did the survivors live on that desert planet for six years? Or have they, did the Breen oh, find them immediately and they've been mining them since well, they, they found them? The, the impression was is that the Breen were the one who captured the ship and shot oh, it down. Oh, that, that yeah. makes even more sense. Okay. I didn't realize that. Thank you, Andrew. That clears up everything. I also, uh, speaking of the ship scene, um, shooting that scene looked absolutely miserable. That scene where they were walking <laughs> like... In the sand. For some reason, walking like across a very <laughs> steep dune. Yeah. So like it, you, you are not even getting like production value out of it. You just have Ducat like stumbling and trying to keep himself up, walking through like eight inches of sand. I feel like Alemo nearly fell during that sequence, and the one oh, that 100%. they used. Yeah, he he was. I, I want to see the I want to see the blooper reel from this episode <laughs> about them in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> they had a very uh, intense B plot originally, but they filmed 24 hours of Ducat falling down the sand dune, and they're like, "Well, we just need a small story on this after this." Um, anything else? Or are we done? Final thoughts? Uh, there was an interesting note. They filmed that scene in the same canyon that they filmed the uh, Lee Nollis escape scene yes. in a couple of seasons before. Yeah, yeah. I think the any... one where the, is that the one where they just walk up to the to the yes. prison <laughs> <laughs> and they knock on the door and say, "Let us in." Um, That's it. We're going to take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. And me, Andrew, and Clay are going to come back. We'll give our final thoughts, read some patron thoughts, and then we will call it a day. What was it like, all that time alone with Ducat? I've had better weeks, but I'll never forget the look on his face when he sat on that set. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I'd been there. Major. Ducat. Where's he at? Waiting for me aboard my ship. We'll be leaving for Cardassia shortly. I think I'll leave the two of you alone. I just wanted to say thank you, Major, for a most interesting journey. You're taking Zial back to Cardassia with you? After six years, she deserves a home and a father. Would that make things difficult for you? I let you know. All right, so Colmini doesn't appear in this episode, but don't hold it against him. It's called Indiscretion. We're going to read some patron thoughts. Uh, Holly McLaughlin says, Indiscretion. This one could have gone wrong about 80 different ways. Putting a sociopathic monster like Ducat with a woman he's gotten more and more creepily predatory towards is very risky, and I'm not sure why it works. Maybe the writers had an unusually good week, and maybe the actors are just that good, but this episode keeps the tension high. The only thing I don't quite believe is that Ducat would be willing to give up everything else for his daughter. It seems murky, like maybe it's a decision he's making as part of a long con to change Kira's view of him. It's unsettling. If the writers and the actors intended that in huge success, I just can't tell. And that's what you guys both believe is the reason he's actually doing it, right? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. Yeah, I think to some I'd agree to some extent. Stephen Cobb says, Indiscretion, this is a great episode. The long-term consequences of this episode are hidden beneath a lot of humor and character development. Cisco's performance was a masterpiece. I love the acting choices he made with his facial expressions, the tone he took with Quark interjecting, then later with Jake explaining how he and Nogner worked out the problem, and finally with, with the less-than-confident way he spoke about Cassidy at the end. Kira and Ducat were fun together. 
I bought Kira's anger and then subsequent acceptance of the absurdity of the situation, and then later her firm insistence on not letting Dukat kill Zayal. I do believe Dukat would have spared Zayal's life in that moment, and it's consistent with his character. I feel he had an immediate shades of regret over the decision once the emotion of the moment had passed. His comment about, I'll let you know, gave us that insight. At this point in the series, he's still a man for whom evil is just a job and not a calling. That not, a, that not totally evil version of Dukat would save Zayal. Later, chaotic evil Dukat would, might not have even considered saving her. If I may add a third paragraph, this episode shows how alliances change constantly at this point, adding to the shades of gray in the morality. Uh, the next one is Zam Nuclear Wessel says, Indiscretion. Bajoran women must really be known as prostitutes throughout the quadrant. Also, preemptive strike and several others. They do have a reputation, it seems. Uh, maybe this one wasn't, she doesn't seem to be a willing uh, lover of Dukat's, this woman. She seems like he just kind of made his choice and stuck with it. Well, they, I mean, he does say that they, they loved each other. So even if it wasn't uh, born of initially consensual, maybe it became, I don't know. I'm that's what sure we can all hope for. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, they, I mean, not to spoil it, but they, they explore some of this later um, yep. about uh, how those yeah. relationships worked. Uh, and Zam Nuker Wessel says, indiscretion, uh, actually, this has to do with a later comment, so I won't read that one. Not many comments for indiscretion, which is understandable, but uh, r- I regret on some level. I think it's a very good Ducat episode. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot to think about. It, it maybe. It's one of those things. I think that as the show matures, it gets better at these com- kind of lower stakes things that I think it still does really well. So maybe it's not a super memorable episode, but I think it's very strong. Um, that's it. Thank I would you guys. also, sorry, I just wanted to say, I uh, I did like Cassidy a lot more in this one than I did in the last one. Because uh, I think, what was it the... Uh, Way of the Warrior was the yeah, last one I, we saw. Yeah, that was the first Cassidy episode I had seen, and I did not particularly like her, but I, I liked her a lot more in this one. She does have, um, a listener pointed out, she has a very weird, weird way of enunciating her words. It's like every syllable is stressed on her. She kind of breaks down all the syllables yeah. of the words. Which she, is, seemed, she seemed more naturalistic in this one. Like, for some reason, in Way of the Warrior, she just seemed really, really weirdly. She had, like, some sort of strange, like, heavy affect going on. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, in this one, I thought, she was, I thought she was fine. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the show. Thank you for leaving your thoughts. Andrew, we'll start off with you, guest of honor. Uh, on our scale of one to five, what are you going to give indiscretion? Um, I thought about this a lot because this is one of these episodes that I think standing just by itself, uh, you could almost give one grade and then look back a season or two later and give a new grade. But to me, this is probably a solid four. Um, the the nuance in the, in the character development for Ducat uh, the ominous overtones of what may be coming, the development of Cisco's relationship. It, it all it all plays together very, very nicely. I give it a four. Clay. Uh yeah, I also give it a four. I thought it was uh I thought it was really good. Um you know, i I echo the same thing everybody else has said. Uh Ducat stuff was great. I mean it's uh it's uh an episode where you get to spend some time with a character that normally you wouldn't think you would get to spend time with that character. Like, the fact that they did this at all with him is unexpected, um, but welcome. Uh, and yeah, it just, it, 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 they, you know, they, they do really well with these Cardassian characters. When they give these characters uh, episodes to themselves to really dig into them, um, you know, whether it's Duet or, uh, I know I didn't really love the, the one about Garrick, but I understand why, you know, people do in retrospect. Mm-hmm. But even, you know, there have been other Garrick Central episodes that have been really good. They just, the, having this morally gray character really seems to bring out the best of, of the, the writers for the show, which I don't know if that's because the, uh, um, because of the black and white nature that was the uh, previous, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Iteration. Uh, mandate oh, for sure. the way to handle things. So having gray characters allow, you know, just let the writers be a little bit more uh, exciting or whatever. But it, they, they do a really good job with these guys. I think it's just it opens up the writers to a level of creativity they didn't have before. Where Before the answer and the outcome was preordained. And yeah. it doesn't it doesn't feel that way here. It feels like you can you can you can come to a Star Trek ending, but there's a different road that you can go down to get there. And I think that it adds a little bit of creativity to the writing process. And I you know, and I kind of think it builds off of what they did with the uh um uh Jem Hadar episode that we that we just watched, which was like two days ago, but I can't yep. remember what it's called. Hippocratic Oath. Yeah, there you go. Um 
because you know I, in that one uh someone had been critical or or other other places had been critical of of undercutting the gem hadar because they're supposed to be this but they're not presented that way and you know i the key to characterization and character uh growth is having a defined character or characteristics and then going well what if this happens and that's antithetical to what that those characters are normally uh presented as um and that's what makes for interesting stories and i think with the cardassians you've got so much breath to do that stuff and with ducat especially you've got so much breath. he has so many relationships with so many people and he's such a specific type of uh politics playing character that you know it is interesting to go well what if ducat you know was in love with a bajoran it's like mm-hmm. oh well that that actually opens up a lot of doors so it's uh it's a really i'm glad that they're taking the chances and and uh and exploring these characters in uh in a way that you know you usually don't get in these in in star trek shows i'm going to uh i'm going to give this a four as well um i always have to battle uh my re configuring of what i can uh, consider like a three to be sort of and mm-hmm. i think i i have to be consistent with the earlier seasons to make the ratings mean anything and i think that this is a better than average episode of the show at the same time you could say that i think what you're saying andrew is like you could consider this a new average level of the show going forward is i, kind of I what, think so because yeah. the the arc storytelling and the way that everything in this episode plays later throughout this season and the next seasons, it, it resets the bar yep. um, for what an average episode is. Right. So that would be my argument is that maybe if you're only looking at the later seasons, this is more of an average, but I think it's a very strong episode uh, that I think, and that'll fit my definition if I would show it, because I think this is when DS9 is actually exceptional at what it does. Um, that's about it. So fours across the board, which is nice. We've had a pretty strong stretch to open the season. It's been enjoyable. It's been nice yeah. after the, the dregs of season one, two, and even three to a <laughs> regard. The middle of season three is terrible. Um, that's about a lot, it. A lot of skipping of episodes in the middle of season three. Season three, you can skip everything <clears> except <throat> for maybe the first four episodes of each in the four or last ones. There's nothing else in the middle there that really needs anything. But we're done. Andrew, uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Wes. I appreciate it. Thank you, Clay. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate all the work you guys do on this. I know there a lot of us uh, love the podcast, and we appreciate all the long hours you guys put in. Thanks. It means a lot. And yeah, uh, you. you guys want to support the show, you can go to the social media links. There's Facebook, Twitter. Go to the Discord channel if you want to chat to us, because it's where the uh, the chatting happens. Well, you'll chat with Wes. I have <laughs> someone who handles that stuff for me. So <laughs> You're like Trump. Um, Clay's personal assistant. <laughs> we we have the patreon.com slash the Penske file. If you want to support the show a couple of dollars a month, you get extra stuff. You can leave your comments, new podcasts, blah, blah, blah. You get the chance to do uh, join the show, as Andrew here has done. And you can rate the show on iTunes, which is much appreciated. We've gotten a bunch of new ratings. I think pointing out that the phone can do it is a, uh, the key to our success here. So use your that's, iPhone. And, that, and that's that's the only reason why I'm consistently the guest host now is because i gave a hundred thousand dollars to the patreon so <laughs> uh check out the podcast on itunes check it out on your iphone rate us please if you don't want to support the show with patreon the least you can do is leave a positive review we'd much appreciate it that's about it i'm done groveling um let's see i think that's pretty much it i think so i think we're done uh guys thank you very much clay thanks for coming on andrew thank you very much for coming on again yeah thank thanks you for having me Guys, we will see you next time with, I'm going to look this up. I know I always forget to do it. What is the next episode? Rejoined, right? I think it is. Rejoined. Yeah, so we'll be talking about when the does, uh When does this come out, Wes, this episode? This comes out Monday, so a week. Uh, not, right? Yes, it comes out because Thursday is Hippocratic. Yes, it comes out in a week. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shamelessly plug my book then. I have a new book out called Poser. It should be in comic book stores now. It's about uh, it's a punk rock slasher story. It's pretty fun. So if you guys see it, pick it up. Yep, it's called Poser. You can support Clay. Say your, give your thanks to Clay for joining the show for these uh, episodes, and you can buy that uh, issue. This is issue two, right? Actually, no. Uh, I'm not going to get into why, but the uh, this is the first issue that's coming out wide release in comic book stores. Gotcha. So, All right, it, so. Uh, by the by, the time this comes out, it will have it will already be out. So you should be able to get it. If if your store doesn't carry, you should be able to ask for it. They can get it for you. Excellent. 
Cool. Guys, thank you very much. And we'll see you next time with Rejoined.